Hey, will you do the roll call? Of course, roll call. <laughs> Joseph Britton? Here. Rachel Chalesky? Here. Kate Canetta? Here. Gladys Cooper? Here. Lauren Daly? Joseph De Silva? Here. Oops, sorry, Lauren. I heard you there. Um, Catherine is, Lauren, is Lauren there? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. She is. Laura, I'm here. Okay, got it. Uh, Catherine Hodgson? Here. Uh, Richard Ginelli? Here. Kathleen Molinero? Here. Albert okay. Russo? Here. Amy Spolino? Here. Everybody's here. Got everybody okay. here. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we're going to start off with the recognitions of our students. Uh, Dr. Sal, you want to start with that? That's a good way to start. Yes, the Connecticut Associated Board of Education recognize students throughout the 169 towns uh, each year and for their contribution to the school overall, uh, to the service of the school and for their leadership. And we have students uh, that we are going to recognize tonight. And I'd like to start, we will go by school. We okay. will start with the um, with Broadview. I, I see that uh, Dr. Thomas is here. Uh, would you like to start, please? Ah, it would be an honor. Um, we're real excited because we have two of the most amazing students in our building. Um, first, we would like to do Jayla uh, Latiga. Like, Jayla is a very caring, compassionate, intelligent young lady. She is her, has continued her exceptional grades in every class. She has this huge thirst for knowledge, and she loves to help others. Um, Jayla is also part of the Excel program, which is a competitive program, which I'm um, just constantly preparing our students, not just for high school, but for college and also a career plan. So Jayla is also part of our National Junior Honor Society at Broadview. And she uses this, this platform to kind of work with other students and her peers and just work in her community. So I would love to just present you to, it won't be the last time you see her at a board meeting, um, Jayla Latigua. Jayla, are you on? Hi, yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, thank you for everything that you said about me. It really warmed my heart. <laughs> uh, you know it's all true, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so good to see you. Thank you for coming. You did, is your mom on or your dad? Um, yeah, my mom is outside because she's is in a mom conference. Or dad on? Yeah, my mom is, um, okay. but she's in a conference right now for her job. But I'll show her to you. Well, we're not gonna bother her. Don't bother her. Let her work. Don't, don't bother your mother. <laughs> Leave her alone, okay? <laughs> because she will get mad at me later. <laughs> so <laughs> she can see me. Yeah. <laughs> Say hi. Okay. All right, Jayla, I'm going to introduce the next person, okay? Okay, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, our next person is Michaela Murphy. She's a, a wonderful young lady, too, who um, exhibits a lot of integrity, determination, compassion, especially about her academics, because she excels in everything. She has... Um, maintain exemplary grades and is just demanding all these demanding courses that she takes she just goes forth and she goes with with full steam she is um has a, a tons of extracurricular activities like dance and karate and all that good stuff and she loves to perform and and, and serve in the community um she is really a leader she is not only a, a great leader she's very humble and kind and um which I think make really great leaders. She's involved in our National Junior Honor Society as well as our student leadership program. And she's committed to not just our Broadview community, but to the community at all. And like I said, you'll see her again in front of this board before she graduates from Danbury High School. <laughs> Michaela, are you on? Yeah, I'm right here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Mom, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing fine, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Sal. And see, you got the DC after all. Yeah, well, no, this is in honor of my- oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see, terrific. Let's go to- uh, Dr. Sal. Yes, ma'am. Before we move on, could I just say on behalf of the board to Jayla and Michaela 
On behalf of the board, we certainly want to say congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love those beautiful smiles. And mm -hmm. thank you for sharing your appearance with us. And we are very proud of you. Thank yes. you again. Well, we've got uh, Dr. Zlita at Rogers Park. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank Hello. you for having us. We're always excited to do this, one of our favorite times of the year. I have two students to introduce to you tonight. We were not able to get um, our first student on with us tonight, but um, our second student is. So our first student is Yandiel Adamas, and he's an eighth grade student at Rogers Park, and he's one of our student ambassadors who helps support us, our families, and our students during many of our events and throughout the day and year. He has also mentored some of our sixth and seventh grade students and helped support them in their schoolwork and to be really a role model for them. He's an active class member of our Latinos in Action class, and he's one of our students who goes down to South Street, or he was going down to South Street, and working with first graders in tutoring them in reading and math. Uh, he's an avid basketball player and baseball player, and he's been one of our students of the month many times over the past three years. He works very hard at maintaining his schoolwork. He's got a great attitude and he contributes his success to his family and friends. So while he's not able to be here tonight, we're super excited to give him this honor. Our second student is Chris Mary Nunez and she is on tonight. If she can hear me, you can turn your video on. Yes, yes. She was on second page. Hi, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm, Hi, Chris Mayer. Hi, honey. Hi. So, I lost my little Chris Mary is um, a leader not only in school, but she's also, as a member of our Latinos in Action class, but she's also a leader outside of school as she's an active Danbury police explorer. Hmm. Her belief is that being, it's an important part of being a leader is that you have to put yourself out there, not be afraid to speak your thoughts and to challenge three, we know, key things for a good leader. She utilizes her leadership skills to help our bilingual students learn English, find their voice, and advocate for their learning, which is, as you know, super important. After school, her involvement in the police explorers provides her with opportunities to assist the police department, as well as go on ride along with real police officers, which must be really cool. She is absolutely a great role model for all the students at Rogers Park, and we are super excited to give her this honor. So Chris Mary, if your parents are there too, we'd love to, to say um, thank you to them for all that they're doing to help. Thank the you. Thank you. Thank you. We have congratulations. Yes, congratulations, Chris Mary. Westside Middle School, Dr. Labanca. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to uh, be with you this evening. We recognize two students, and again, very excited to be able to do this. So, uh, so first is Ken Salem, uh, a Kenny student who enjoys stepping out of his comfort zone, and he is certainly a leader in our National Junior Honor Society, has helped students out at Mill Ridge, and is a volunteer big brother with struggling readers. Um, he's an upstander in our school. He stands up for everyone. He's a positive role model, and he recognizes his parents for the positive contributions that they make to make him successful at school as well. So congratulations, Kenny. And I'm sure your mother would be much happier if I said congratulations, Kenneth. <laughs> He's right there, I see him. I see him in the face too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you said. You being great from school. Uh, yeah. that, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you. You're welcome, congratulations. Yes, yes. yes. And and Go ahead. And second, I'd like to recognize Maria Eduardo Sosa. Uh, Maria is an active member of the National Junior Honor Society as well. And she's an ex she excels in all her classes and she also shows leadership. She's got a humble uh, sense to her. She's kind, respectful and empathetic. And she certainly strives for excellence in whatever she does. She has been uh, two years running a top five in the state of Connecticut for the Connecticut Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, she's got the goal of becoming a scientist, uh, which is really exciting. I've had the pleasure of of working with Maria directly on some of her research projects, you know, a lot of fun, and and you can see her will and determination and hard work. I, I often have to tell her you have to go home. It's you've you've done enough work for one day, uh, and uh, she's just a, really a shining star in our school and just such a positive person. And we're really thrilled to be able to award her this. So congratulations, Maria. Congratulations, Maria. congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank Dan, you. Danbury High School. Uh, Dan, Donovan. How are you? Good. 
Uh, you'll notice I don't have a fancy background like everybody else because when I went to go put mine on, uh, it said my computer does not have a quad core Intel processor allowing me to do that. That's so, what mine says, Dan, so don't yeah, feel bad. So you're stuck with uh, the first year of my kids' lives behind me. That's a picture of every, if you're wondering what it is, it's a picture of every month of their first year. So um, with that, I have two awesome uh, students here with me. You know, at Danbury High School, we have quite a few to choose from, uh, but these two really stood out to me uh, when looking at the senior class and, and I thought they did it, they deserved it. And I see, I'm gonna go ladies first. I see Larissa sitting there with her mother. Um, and Larissa is a scholar who believes that anything can be accomplished through hard work and persistence. Uh, she is the president of our Board of Governors at Danbury High School, has an impressive 3.9 GPA, uh, and shows an incredible worth ethic and believes that working to, to reach her goals is her greatest comfort, though, is helping others. Mm -hmm. uh, her experience with tutoring young students through the National English Honor Society uh, taught her that patience is a virtue, welcome to our world, and displayed how much of an impact she can make in the community. Uh, her value is found in helping others around her because she is constantly currently working along with members of our community uh, to form the new portrait of a graduate at, uh, for Danbury Public Schools. This year alone in the BOG, she organized an awesome homecoming dance for us, uh, created a, a lot of exciting activities, helped with raise money for organizations like Special Olympics and Jericho. They've been very active um, during this closure with running a virtual spirit week for the school. Um, trying to keep spirits up and overall uh, having such a leadership opportunities has taught her that, you know, with helping hands and a positive mindset, any goal can be accomplished and both her and her twin sister. So I, from this distance, I can't tell which one I'm actually looking at. It might be her, uh, but her twin sister Lorena are attending UConn in the fall. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Larissa. So, thanks. This is my twin. Hello. This is my mom. Hello. <laughs> Gotta make sure. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's the past 12 years. It's really been a pleasure to be a part of Danbury Public Schools. Um, I came here at five years old and learning English was like such difficulty for me, but um, the Danbury Public School system really helped me throughout this whole process and I'm so grateful um, to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it was a pleasure working with you this year in the BOG. Um, our second student is Aiden Byrne. Uh, he's a scholar athlete at Danbury High School, has worked hard and achieved a 4.45 GPA and his position as a cross country team captain. Aiden has taken the challenging mix of honors and AP classes and is ranked 22nd out of 772 students. Uh, this winter, he received the FCAC Exemplary Scholar Athlete Award. He is also uh, FC, all FCAC, second team is junior year for cross country and a varsity athlete in both indoor and outdoor track. While most of his time uh, is spent in the classroom, outside the classroom, um, he maintains all this academic and athletic prowess while working as a cashier at Rite Aid. He is also honors all of his commitments for the National Honor Society, the National Business Honor Society, and DECA. In addition, he is a member of peer leadership. His peer leadership project this year, he worked with other seniors to make the school, school community a better place. Um, a couple of peer leaders in Aiden organized a bunch of gift donations right around Christmas time um, to Yale New Haven Hospital, uh, which was very successful. Uh, his goal is to constantly improve himself and the lives of others around him. And he'll answer this question in a minute because I'm not sure. I know he's going to Stonehill College, but I'm not sure if you're going to run there. Are you running there as well, Aiden? Yes, I'm going to run on the cross country and track teams at Stonehill. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Mr. Donovan. I'm, uh, thank you. Congratulations, thank you. mom and dad in the background there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We have the uh, alternative Senate, John Webb. Mr. John Weber for ACE. John? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, with the Cable Awards and with the Superintendent Awards, what we usually do is we have the teachers who are the guidance teachers of the students who have really built strong relationships with them write the bios for them because they get to know the family best and they, and they get to go know the students best. Um, our two award winners aren't able to be here tonight, but I, I want to represent them and, and read the bios that were written by their guidance teachers. So the first is Tamara Souza. In looking at the criteria for the Cave Award, uh, it was evident that Tamara Souza is one who fits 
the criteria quite nicely. She's been representing ACE for at least two years as a STARS participant to work in collaboration with other alternative schools in Connecticut. She's been the sole ACE student representative at the Board of Ed meetings for the last two years. And through her participation and involvement, she's seen uh, herself be able to build relationships with the board, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and other cabinet members in the Danbury district. Tamara has earned the Youth of the Month Award for November 2019 as recognized by the Danbury Exchange Club, which then made her eligible to win the Youth of the Year uh, Award in the spring. Um, she's been recognized several times for her achievements within our, our program for Student of the Month, for making honors, for making high honors, for winning the uh, Ace of Spades for Hard Work, the Ace of Hearts for Caring, and, and she's known for keeping promises and, and keeping her commitments. Um, and she is, she's also someone who has reached out to her peers uh, the whole time she's been an ace to, to provide support to her, to her peers. Um, just the last thing I would say about her that I'm adding to the, to the bio is that in the beginning of the year, she came to me and she said, I feel like you represent the, uh, you award students for their accomplishments. And she said, how come, the staff never gets any awards. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, I'm going to, I'm going to organize a staff of the month award. And anybody who works at ACE can earn that award. It doesn't have to be a teacher. And so she started taking votes every month. And then at our large guidance, when we have the entire building in an assembly, she will present the staff of the month award to staff members. So she's somebody who really gives back, not just to um, you know, the building, but she appreciates the things that she's uh, been given at ACE and in Danbury Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Our second award winner is Amy Elmaro Bell. Uh, Amy is an exceptionally motivated and dedicated student who has often been known to put the needs of other people before herself. Uh, while this is often a respectable quality, it can also present downfalls. Uh, this has happened to Amy in the past as she had found herself struggling in school at Danbury High School because she was busy taking care of everyone else leading to her decision to apply and come down to ACE. Since coming to ACE, she's been trying to balance her own needs with the needs of others. She's volunteered to help at all the building-wide community service events. Uh, she has been a high honor student this entire year and her academic excellence has pushed her towards putting herself in a position to graduate this June, uh, which in the beginning of the year in September, she was not on the list to graduate in June, uh, but she, her, through her hard work, she's got herself there. So I just want to celebrate those two students and say thank you for having us. Thank you and congratulations to them. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you, John. Okay, the next, the next um, thing we have under recognition with the, our new assistant principals. And I thought first, before I read, uh, look at the, uh, share with you a little bit about the resume, I'd let uh, Kim Thompson talk a little bit about the process. And then I'll talk a little bit about the resume. And then both principals will talk a little bit about um, their selection uh, sure. with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sell. Um, so as many of you know, what, um, we typically operate with um, assistant principal and principal positions with a two panel interview system. Um, and it includes a wide swath of administrators and teachers, staff members, um, all of whom contribute to this um, vetting of candidates for the assistant principal position. Um, typically we require white writing samples and we have a pretty rigorous questioning policy um, in these panels. And this year was no exception to that um, rigor. It was a little bit different given the COVID crisis. We um, collapsed into a single panel, so fewer participants, but none uh, more enthusiastic ever than the panel that we had this year that also included um, our own board member, Mr. De Silva, and some administrators and teachers as well. So people who um, run the gauntlet here in Danbury certainly have to go through their motions, whether they are new to us or whether they are um, interims, as our two candidates this year were. Um, and it was just a nice um, opportunity Opportunity, I think for each one of them to showcase their achievements from this year and before. Um, and so we'll turn it over to Dr. Sell to tell you who they are. Great. All right, why don't we start with Westside Middle School. Um, this is Jennifer's second year with this, but Jennifer 
serves currently, she serves currently as the interim assistant principal um, at Westside. She had worked with us uh, as a language arts specialist uh, for a four year where she did uh, work with um, the social effective development of students, both intellectually and socially, as I mentioned. She was responsible to the building principal for, for literacy administrator to coordinate the program with them. Um, and she, during that time, demonstrated great knowledge for diagnosis and intervention acceleration of students. Prior to that, she worked in, um, in Hartford. She was interim principal at Hartford Public Schools from February 2018. Uh, to July at uh, Thurman Milner School. She also was the assistant principal of curriculum instruction and literacy at the Hartford Public Schools uh, from 2013 till she left there and came with us. Um, and in that role, she, as you would imagine, she was really not what I call just de dealing with the student department, but she worked as an instructional leader, which led her, I think, into the positions that she has now, where she's been a, a great resource to, um, to our district and to the principal. I'll let Dr. Labanka now talk a little bit about her, and um, then we'll go to the next candidate. Congratulations there, uh, Jennifer. Frank. Thank you, Dr. South. So it is just wonderful to have Jennifer Blue as our, our official assistant principal now. She comes to us with such a wealth of knowledge, and I think, you know, uh, for me personally, it's such a, a great compliment to my skill set in terms of uh, our instructional sharing. She uh, manages our humanities departments while I'm managing STEM departments and, and that work we do together, especially around helping students accelerate their learning. Uh, she's got such great strength in that and I think that's a huge value. Uh, she's made such positive relationships with our students and our parents and uh, she's uh, such a welcome part of the Westside family and I look forward to many years working with her. Congratulations, Jennifer. Jennifer, get online. Where are you? Oh, there I go. There she goes. Oh, nice background. Where'd you get that? I'm sorry? Where'd you get that background? Can you hear I me, Jennifer? Academy, this background. Oh, all right. Good, good. <laughs> want to say anything? Would you like to say anything? I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I, um, I enjoy my job so much at Westside. Uh, it's just a wonderful community and I feel fortunate to be working there. So I'm honored and grateful and look forward to the upcoming school year without this dark cloud of virus over us, but we'll manage, we're gonna manage, we're trying our best. So I thank you very much. Well, thank you. Talking. Thank you, congratulations. Okay, and next, um, over at uh, Broadview Middle School, she, uh, we have Shelly Rinaldi, and um, Shelly currently serves as the interim assistant principal, um, and she's been responsible for doing evaluation, doing collaboration curriculum, um, facil facilitating the professional development. But prior to that, uh, Shelly did work with us in the era of literacy and the ELA curriculum. Um, she really personally created uh, our intervention program maintained it, was giving us a lot of um, information for making decisions for youngsters so that they would be placed in, in the right programs, get the assistance that they needed. And when we had an opportunity um, to look for someone who could help in terms of the structure of a middle school, understanding child development and had such a wonderful curriculum background, uh, Dr. Thomas said, hmm, what shall I do? And I'm going to let her talk about Shelly right now. It was very simple. I needed her. <laughs> um, honestly, Shelly is well-rounded. Every principal looks for someone who can fill the weakness, whatever area of weakness. And um, her strength and in intervention and being able to look at students at different angles is something that we're going to definitely need at Broadview. Um, and she just has a great disposition. Nothing seems to phase her. Um, every morning, it's almost annoying because we meet at eight o'clock in the morning and she's got a smile on like eight o'clock in the morning, just smiling. <laughs> and, um, and in return, I think that this has just been a great um, position for her to be fill in. So we're real excited. And not only that, we're excited at the middle school level because we have two amazing um, assistant principals that are joining us. And I think it's going to make our team extremely strong. Kelly, are you there? 
<laughs> Thank you. Shelly um, there? Oh, Shelly isn't here. I'm sorry. Shelly had a family emergency. So she oh. did tell me to let you guys know that she really appreciated and she um, thank you very much for the opportunity. She is so thrilled to be in a one place in a building and she just wants to, um, for me to just reach out and say thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it, thank you. Public thank participation. You. Mm -hmm. As of right now, there is no public participation. Okay. okay. We're going to do the employee representative part, though, as well, right? Um, according to my agenda, we're looking at the consent calendar first. No, we're looking at the consent calendar. Man. Yeah, that's next. Yeah, and then, then employee rep. Okay, and then the employee. So, okay, you want to make the uh, motion for the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Gladys. Uh, I'll make a motion that the Board of Education approves the items on the consent calendar, Exhibit 20-47 through Exhibit 20-49 as recommended. Motion made by Kate. Could I hear a second? Al's got his hand up there. Al made uh, a second in motion. Any questions concerning the motions? Seeing none, could um, we do... Uh, Name count. Okay. Well, that's what I was in, in told to do. Okay. So I'll do a, a just a roll call on that. Yeah. Roll call. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Britton. Who's yes. all? Uh, Rachel Shaleski. Aye. Kate Canetta. Aye. Gladys Cooper. Aye. Lauren Daly. Aye. Uh, Joseph De Silva. Aye. Catherine Hodgson. Aye. Richard Janelli. Aye. Kathleen Molinero. Aye. Albert Russo. Aye. Amy Spilino. Amy? A <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Aye. There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the motion is carried. Thank you. Employee representative. Hey, Chairperson Cooper, can can we let the parents know? I mean, the parents and the students know that it's okay for them to leave. Yes, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Aaron. That's okay. So, students, we we just want to take this moment to congratulate you all, um, and we appreciate you staying on. But we also just wanted to let you know if you left, that's also okay. Uh, but we thank you guys for being part of the meeting. And I know we also have some school student reps. So if you guys are hanging around, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Cooper. Oh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Okay. Near Aaron, employee rep. Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody is doing well tonight. Thank um, you. Good. It's good to see everybody and see all of your happy, healthy faces tonight. I um, wanted to take a minute, and I'm going to do this a little bit teacher style. So when we write report cards, we always start off with all the positives that we want to talk about. We couch in a little bit of the things that we want to work on and get better at, and then wrap it up with some positives. So I want to start out with some really amazing positives that I want to tell you about. Um, our teachers continue to show their commitment to the community through their volunteerism, their outreach, and their generosity. And so with this pandemic going on and a lot of our union sponsored um, events that were canceled, we wanted to take that money that we weren't using on some of our events like our retirement end of the year um, teacher celebration dinner. And we wanted to put it toward a cause that would benefit our students and our families. So uh, our members took a vote and they voted to donate $5,000 to the community, uh, which all went to combat um, food insecurity in our community. We donated $1,000 to the Connecticut Food Bank. We donated $1,000 to the Daily Bread Food Pantry, $1,000 to the New American Dream Foundation to continue the meal program on Saturdays, which has been so successful. And then we uh, voted to donate $2,000 to the Broadview Pantry. 
And I just want to give a shout out to uh, this group of teachers that has been doing amazing work at Broadview. They were doing amazing work year round, making sure the needs of their students were taken care of by setting up a little boutique in the school to provide um, food items and sanitary products for the students that needed them and hygiene products. Um, they were doing all this wonderful stuff before this happened and then the pandemic struck and they knew that they had families that really needed some support so they wanted to continue the program, but the program has actually taken on all new legs. And um, what they're doing is feeding a, approximately, I think they're up to 35 families now uh, on a weekly basis. And it's uh, really an army of teachers, not only from Broadview, but from other schools as well, that are shopping, that are um, collecting Amazon food orders that the community has donated, and they're driving these packages that they put together to students' homes on a weekly basis, making sure that students have bread, milk, eggs, and basic um, essentials for them. Um, I, I do need to mention that one of our wonderful uh, paraprofessionals at Broadview, Laura Hallis, um, actually really played a huge role in this because she donated the uh, greenhouse at uh, the Hallis Farm property, which she owns, uh, to make sure that all of the packaging and all of the food items could get sent there and serve as kind of a distribution spot for all the teachers to collect and um, socially distance put these packages together. So these are the kinds of stories that, you know, kind of warm my heart and show all the things that teachers do and to go above and beyond and show our staff dedication to help our families in need. So that's some really good news. Um, some more really important good news to share was, uh, is that teachers are becoming increasingly proficient with their new technologies. Um, they're taking new risks to apply their, their new learned technologies and new strategies to their Google Classrooms. And um, they're taking risks to use all these new things like screen sharing and little little tools that we've all learned how to do in this uh, pandemic to make sure that th their students are getting the benefit of good quality instruction. Um, they're improving their uh, engagement strategies and teachers are now beginning uh, en masse to implement synchronous learning um, techniques which involve live meetings with their students. And this is something many, many teachers had been doing already but now it's going to be something that's going to be moving forward, going to be part of our, our weekly routines. Um, it's very important. We need to make sure that we're connecting with our students to improve the social emotional learning process, make sure our students feel connected with us, connected with their community, connected with their schools. So um, these live meetings are going to be serving as a really positive step forward in our um, distance learning plan. So that was, that was something that I really wanted to make sure that everybody understands the hard work that um, we've kind of put forward to make all those different phases of our distance learning plan uh, come together. And this is kind of the last crucial piece that we're going to be working on for the remainder of the year and holding on to all that new learning in case we need to use it, which um, I'm sure we're going to in the months to come for next year. Moving forward, um, I wanna just talk a little bit about um, something that Commissioner Cardona said a few days ago um, when talking about returning back to school in the fall, he said a return to normalcy will have to be a marathon and not a sprint. And he also discussed of how it's not going to look anything like any of us are used to. With that in mind, I really wanna implore and caution the board um, not to fall pressure to rush to return to school um, without a thoughtfully put together plan that makes sure that safety is paramount and that safety is the focus of our employees and our students. I know that there's going to be a lot of push from outside sources and community members and you know statewide a push to maybe move forward and if we're not quite ready, I'm imploring you to make sure that our plan is put together and don't fall victim to that pressure. Um, we wanna make sure our students and our staff are not sacrificial lambs just to jumpstart the economy. Our health and safety is the most important thing. And you know we can't have quality learning and quality instruction if we're not healthy. So we need to make sure that that is the focus 
I know we have a team that's put together to study the reentry, and um, I just want to uh, also make um, a request. While I'm part of that team, I want to request that there are other teachers and actually um, all building stakeholders or district stakeholders, employees that work that will have a voice in putting the plan together. Um, we have an incredible bra bra brain power that's um, collective and putting that brain power together to work on a plan, we really need to use those resources for our safe return. And um, I think that it's very important that you tap into the ideas um, and the experiences of our staff members. Um, I've already had many, many emails from people offering suggestions. Collectively, uh, moving forward, our state union has a set of guidelines that they're going to be really emphasizing for the going back to school process, which includes things that we've already heard in the news and that we've talked about, comprehensive testing for our staff members, potentially our students as well, contact tracing and track uh, tracking of the virus, uh, requirements, and this is really important, a requirement for making sure we have everyone that comes back to school is wearing protective equipment. Um, district provided protected equipment is something that we're going to need to discuss moving forward. Uh, we'll need to make sure that the district protocol for disinfecting and sanitizing is put into place and that the district has the funding to continue to do that while we still need to do that. It's not something we should be, you know, falling short and worrying about back ordering of products. It's something that we have to be prepared for and that we have to have it in place in order to restart school. There are a lot of other items that, you know, we'll be talking about in the weeks and months to come. But I just wanted to kind of put that in the mindset of the board of knowing where we're coming from that, you know, obviously safety is paramount for all. Um, a couple of things I think that our teachers are voicing, we need to get better at as a district. And I don't think anybody would disagree about that is um, how we're reaching out to our families to make sure all of our students are engaged and some of our students who we have not been able to connect with or reach or bring in to the day-to-day um, -day distance learning process uh, on an effective level. Um, we need to make sure that our, those contacts are done in an efficient manner. Uh, my example for this would be currently teachers are making um, the predominance of all the phone calls to parents and the secondary layer would be guidance counselors and PPS staff. Um, as we move forward, we're gonna to need to really utilize all of our employees to make sure that they're all reaching out and connecting with students. And it's not just the teachers who are also providing instruction, also providing, you know, writing new curriculum and to that's going to be distance learning appropriate. Um, teachers shouldn't be the only ones doing the heavy lifting with the, the parent communication. So we need to come up with a plan district-wide mm -hmm. that improves upon what we're currently doing. Um, I want to just also talk about very briefly, I know it's budget season and being that teachers are doing this extreme heavy lifting to make all of this work happen. Um, I want to make sure the board is going to continue to support the, them by making sure that they have the resources and financial support to continue to make all of this happen. Um, we as a district, we know this, we're always shortchanged here in Danbury and now more than ever, we need to increase our educational funding. Last September, ranking 169th, we all know was an absolute disgrace. Um, but right now, that disgrace has turned into an emergency and we can't continue, we can't afford to fall further behind than we already are. We've gotta make sure that funding is a priority and that you know we're, we're shouting to all the people that are going to listen statewide um, in, our, in our community that ensures that our students aren't shortchanged um, and they get all the resources that they need. I told you I'm gonna wrap it up with some positivity. That was all my, my couch things that we need to work on. Um, I have to say, and I will give um, a shout out to Dr. Sal. Um, I am encouraged by the current communication that, and the relationship that we have been fostering throughout this, this process. Um, the dialogue has been super with administration. Um, 
we're having weekly meetings, we're talking about things, even if we don't agree on how we're going to go about it, the dialogue is open, the communication is open. And I think that's really the best way moving mm -hmm. forward to continue our collaborative relationship. So Dr. Sal, I thank you for your leadership on that level. And I hope that we can continue that collaborative relationship. I really think it's to all of our benefits to keep that, that communication open and in moving forward. So hopefully that will continue um, throughout the summer as we work on all the hard work and the heavy lifting that still needs to be done. And I thank you very much for your time and I hope everyone continues to stay well. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much, Ms. Cooper. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our student rep. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Fine. Okay, so me and Larissa are here from DHS. Um, okay. I'm Becca, the BOG treasurer. Um, Larissa and I just want to share a few things that are happening digitally at DHS. Um, first off, this week or last week was um, Teacher Appreciation Week and the National Honor Society and peer leadership classes came together to create an activity where we sent emails to all the student to all the teachers. So the students signed up for a teacher and then we would send um, emails to each teacher, which was really successful. Um, this week we started AP testing at DHS. Um, I personally have taken two tests so far. Um, they went really well. Um, some people had some issues, but um, We'll keep the district updated with how that's going. Um, I know it's new. Um, we've never done this before, so and neither has College Board. So hopefully it goes well. Um, we started a new schedule this week. Uh, I'm not sure if any other schools have, where we um, have a days on like a Monday, and then we submit everything by that by Wednesday night. And this is just to ensure that kids are submitting their um, work on time, making sure that kids are healthy and, you know, their mental health is coming before, you know, some other things. So I think it's, um, it's working out so far for me and I hope it's working out for all the other kids. I'm going to pass it over to Larissa and she's going to continue. Everyone. Um, so the DHS PTO um, is also hosting a junior prom picture commission. Um, so that they don't feel left out since they're not going to be able to participate in prom prom this year. Um, the BOG and the senior class officers are also hosting a prom picture submission um, for the senior class, which will highlight their outfits in a fun video. Um, the graduation plan is still pending for the class of 2020, as many of you probably know. And as the year comes to an end, the senior class officers have created an Instagram um, to show some of our graduates' future schools and their plans. And I think that is all for today. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing the information with the board. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I am here to speak for ACE. Um, so I would like to thank you all for allowing me to represent the Alternative Center and share what's going on with our family during this time of distance learning. So ACE staff has created a Google Classroom called A Strong in an effort to connect all students and build community. In this class, staff have created fun activities, video messages to students, and resources for supporting each other during this difficult time. A staff is recognizing students' achievements through the use of flip grids that allow staff to publicly appreciate students and these flip grids can be viewed in the A Strong class as well as on the ACE website. Um, Daniela Esposito and Kyle Tricola have launched the ACE Renaissance Fair for all world studies and English one students and will run all week. The fair involves the fair involves virtual field trips to the Globe Theater, interactive learning activities, trivia games, and prizes for students. The fair was created in an effort to engage students and their guardians in learning together during this time of distance learning. Lastly, as we approach the end of the year, 
plans for celebrating our seniors graduates are underway and will be shared out soon. May America be above everything and God above everyone. Thank you all so much for supporting our ACE family and stay safe, everybody. Thank you Thank all. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Tamara. Um, Madam Chairman, may I make a request, please? Yes. On the presentation, I hadn't, I was uncertain if we were going to be able to do this and seeing that I have the principals there tonight and um, there's been uh, questions about graduation and other things, commencement, moving up ceremonies. And I will go on record now. We've been waiting for the commissioner to give us guidelines, but uh, I know that the principals and Dan and the rest have been really personally um, just at their wits ends trying to figure out how to recognize these wonderful youngsters for their uh, accomplishments and also for their moving up ceremony for graduating. And, and they're with us tonight. If it's okay with you, I'd like them to talk about what they're thinking about. And then I know that this Friday, we're supposed to get guidelines about uh, what we can and cannot do. Uh, we know we can't do large group gatherings, but uh, there seems to be some options for small, less than 10 uh, recognition. So if it's okay with you on the presentation, I will have them talk about what they're thinking about, if it's all right. Yes, it's okay, Dr. Sale, yes. Thank you. So why don't we start with uh, Dan? I know, Dan, um, you were you did some survey and talking to some students and parents. Maybe you could tell the board what you've done and sort of um, <laughs> the brainchild of what you're thinking. Dan, are you there? Ah, he's on mute. No, I was on mute, sorry. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to push the envelope in every way we can. So, you know, we haven't come out with any plans yet because, like you said, we were waiting for the guidelines because I think that May 20th deadline of the state may change a couple of things that we can do. But so patience for everyone that's out there on our senior class because, you know, we're trying to put stuff together. I did have um, and listened to ideas from first the class officers I had a meeting with. Um, I met with the BOG and Larissa and the group. Uh, I had a, you know, Zoom with the class of 2020, sent out an invitation to anybody that wanted to go. I had a principal's breakfast uh, and tried to tell them my thinking as, as well. So we, we've trying to communicate our ideas, but not our plan, because we don't know if our plan is going to be successful yet. I have been in conversations with uh, the Danbury Police Department on what we can do. And, and actually Mayor Mark, who were very receptive to trying to give the class of 2020 everything that they can they can get uh, because they were um, so shortchanged on everything they had coming up at the one of, you know what's the one of the best parts of high school. Um, so we are looking at two different kind of major events for our seniors right now. One is our cap and gown distribution, yearbook, gold cords, tassels, things like that. Uh, the issue being with like that is the date of which we're gonna get stuff. Um, like everything else, cap and gowns were not an essential uh, organization to be running, so they were shut down. Yearbooks were shut down. And they're doing the best that they can to try to get us this as early as possible. Plus, graduating on June 12th is in some cases a week and a half to two weeks earlier than we normally do. So there's a problem with that with our dates. But cap and gown distribution and graduation. We're looking for, you know, cap and gown distribution to be more of a, uh, you know, car parade type, inviting the staff in, socially distanced, away from each other, out on the sidewalk. Kids, you know, drive up, decorate the front of the building type stuff. They can decorate cars, uh, things like that. Drive up, put their name up in the window. We throw the cap and gown and yearbook or whatever in the back. That's kind of our, our thing going there, more of the, the party type style than graduation. Graduation, um, we're looking to have an in-person event, um, and you got to kind of follow me on this one, <laughs> an in-person event in which the students will be able to wear those cap and gowns, walk across the stage in the front of Danbury High School, uh, hear their name called, have their family present in a designated area, uh, trying to uh, take pictures and all that stuff. We'll have photographers there as well and all that stuff, but put a stage up there, decorate it, put a tent over it. So it looks very similar to what we kind of do now uh, and have them designate times for kids to come. Um, obviously breaking it down by the different levels and alphabet. Uh, we're still working through how long it's going to take the, the, you know, the, 
parking and all that we're pretty good with on the routes and things and talking to the police and everything for traffic on how we could do that. The problem is there are 780, 772 students slated to graduate this year. If each student takes approximately two minutes uh, up on stage or anything like that, you're looking at like 25 hours of graduation ceremony. Um, so it's something that <laughs> I don't know if I can stand there for 24 hours. I'll give it my best shot, but um, you know, it's, it's a long time. So what we're going to do is break it down over three days times, you know, starting at nine o'clock in the morning, going to four o'clock in the afternoon and get kids, uh, anyone who wants to, they certainly don't have to, and hand them their diploma and get them all their stuff, picture opportunity and stuff like that. So they can have that moment of actually walking across the stage. You know, normally I would invite, and they're more than welcome, any board member that wants, but I certainly understand that they're not going to be there the whole time. Um, you know, but I would be there uh, to, you know, hand the diploma to kids and socially distance, you know, take some pictures and things like that. So we are really working hard at what we can do. There's a, a million ideas out there. The problem is a lot, a million ideas, you know, don't fit Danbury High School. You know, uh, if I had 200 seniors, there's a lot more I could do. You know, we would probably push the envelope for almost an in-person one. Uh, you know, we were looking at and uh, how can we do this in groups and the problem becomes, you know, the numbers we're allowed to have in the current regulations and orders from the from the governor and things like that. So we're working for it. I do have to give a shout out to our PTO members, uh, especially Kathy Snow and uh, Rich Mexinger, who went on this um, awesome, you know, yard sign thing, which we've had for years, but this year it really took off. And there's, they've sold, um, you know, somewhere around 350 yard signs, many of which were donated by the community um, that we can go out and we're having that pickup supposedly on the 16th, the same thing, kids drive up roll down the back window, we throw it in there and things like that. Um, you know, we were looking to see if we could get every single one to every kid, um, but it doesn't seem like we're gonna be able to do that just on the timing parts of it, but I do have to give a shout out to them. So those are kind of our plans. The reason I haven't put them out there or haven't put anything out there is when you release something to, uh, you know, 772 families, Sometimes it gets twisted and sometimes it gets in. If we have to retract anything from that because we're not allowed to do it for whatever reason, uh, then it becomes a problem. So we're waiting to get this solid go ahead that we can do this and, and then we'll move forward. So uh, we're going to talk about the rest, but the board can empathize with you. I, I think um, very easy to do it online, but Dan tried to personalize it and has been uh, really thinking through how we could do that. So um, I appreciate that, Dan. I, no just got an, I just got an email I just sent to you. Supposedly, we're going to get these guidelines on Friday. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I read that. You know, and Did you see that? Yeah. I, you know, the one thing in, in the meetings that the, the students, the kids really didn't want is a virtual. They didn't right. want the you know, something like that. They, they really wanted the in-person part, cap and gown wearing you know, stuff like that. So that's kind of what we're, we're, we're trying to build towards. It's just very difficult when we're building these, you know, and it's changing and everything like that. So let's go to the, let's go to, to uh, if you don't mind, we'll go to John now, Weber, and then we'll go to the middle schools. Yeah, I could be pretty quick and, and, and really echo a lot of what Dan said in terms of putting a plan together, but not releasing it until we have the guidelines uh, partly because it becomes difficult to retract. And also, I, I don't want to get kids' hopes up for a certain type of event and then have to pull it back from them. Um, what we're looking at, Dan mentioned, you know, if he had fewer graduates, he might have more flexibility uh, to be able to work something like this and put something like this together. We, we obviously have a much smaller number of graduates than Dan does. So I'm looking at a hybrid of an in-person uh, event that is outdoors using social distancing and following all of the, the state guidelines and directives, as well as recording the speeches that guidance teachers give about the kids, as well as the speeches that the kids write for the guidance teachers. Um, but I, I don't want to put anything out there yet. I, I want to have a, a, a cooked up definite plan, but I don't want to put it out there until I know that we can uh, safely execute it and that it falls within the, the state guidelines. Uh, the other thing that we, we also did was a uh, 
you know, and I also don't want to ruin some surprises for kids because I was trying to, to have some surprises, but the, uh, the, the flag idea is something that we already ordered and we're waiting on the delivery for those. Um, the flags all have um, some personalized aspects uh, to them with regards to the students in the school. And that's it. Let, let's go to the middle school. Um, I guess, uh, why don't Christy, so, so. why don't we... So I can I can represent the group. I don't know if all of them are here. I told them I'd speak on their behalf. Um, so the, the middle schools, um, you know, like John, like Dan, um, are very interested in, in, in trying to pull off something that's meaning, promotion, a meaningful exercise for the for the moving up ceremony for eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, the three principals feel comfortable. They can do something really meaningful and worthwhile in a virtual environment and platform. Um, and they're excited to announce that they would like to um, have that on June 11th. And I have some times that we would like to release soon, uh, but we probably should wait until after Friday when there, there's more guidance coming out from the state. Okay, so let me just go back to Dan for a second. Dan, um, because you had mentioned the last, the, the, the last day of school, which has been typically our graduation date, um, you said there'd be, if, if it would be permissible, you would do this in thirds as well. Would it end on that date? Is that what you're thinking? Just so the board gets an idea. Yeah, we're planning. Uh, I mean, I got to go back and look at the exact times, but at June 10th, 11th, and end on the 12th. Um, you know, there's 200. I believe it was 240 graduates day one, 300 and something day two, and a lower number. I think for anybody who missed their time, we can play a little catch up at the end. Um, who couldn't make it during the other times, you know, we could get 700 people. We might get 300. I'm not sure which way it's going to go. Yeah, okay. All right. I just wanted them to hear that. It sounds like a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday thing. That's all. Yeah. It's going to be a, a marathon. Okay. Uh, marathons are good. Marathons. I don't run marathons. marathons. Well, we sh both should a little bit anyway. Um, okay. So thank you for doing, I appreciate that. I don't know if anybody has any questions because they're here. It might be a good time. Does any board members have any questions to either uh, John or Ms. Donovan? Or I think, I think also we have some middle school principals here too. Yeah. Edie's still here. Catherine, are you raising your? So yes, thank you. So my question would be is if Dan's planning a three day and somebody has a high schooler and a middle schooler and the middle schools are gonna do it on the 11th, I thought I heard, that wouldn't be conducive for the parents, right? To be in two places at once. Yeah, we, um, we, mine's we during the coordinate. Mine's during the day. Mine will be right. nine to four. Is theirs are at night. They're five thirty okay. to seven. All right. Five thirty okay. to seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that they weren't overlapping because of I had that at one point. <laughs> yeah, we, we had the conversation. We had the conversation with the high school to make sure okay. before that conflict. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm, thank you. I know, thank you. Okay. We can move on down the agenda if there's no other questions. Okay. Action item. Action item A, Kate. Uh, action item A, education specifications for Ellsworth Street School Annex. I'll make a motion that the Board of Education approve the education specifications for the Ellsworth Street School Annex as recommended by the Sites and Facilities Committee in accordance with 20-50. Second. second. A motion made by Kate, seconded by Catherine. Are there any questions concerning the motion? Um, I, I, I just wanted you to know, I do have Glenn Yagel here and Antonio on a roll in case there are any questions. Yeah, I've got a question. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Okay, Dr. Sal or whomever, the, what is the security in terms of entering the building if somebody wants to see someone on a second floor is there a difference between, is there a separation so they, they cannot go to the classrooms on the first floor? I'll, I think, uh, about Glenn, would you talk speak to that or Kelly, either one of them? Glenn or Kelly? Glenn, are you there? Okay, he's on mute. If on mute there, Glenn. Glenn. Speak to it, but I can answer questions as well. Um, yeah, so there he is. Sal, the is, I don't know if Glenn is here, Mr. Janelli. There, there, there are indeed he, two. He, he's here, Glenn Nagel. 
I got it. Sal, it's it's Antonio. I can answer that. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Antonio. Yeah, we, um, Richard, we uh, have gone um, through an extensive process of uh, dealing with security on this annex building. Um, there is uh, there is a checkpoint uh, that will uh, uh, basically allow everybody to come into the building and access uh, the second floor. Um, as well as if we want them, get them into uh, Ellsworth School themselves. Uh, as a security office, um, a major checkpoint, uh, nobody can get in and out. Um, so uh, uh, if somebody wants to visit somebody on the second floor, they would come in through the security office, uh, state what their reason is for the visit, and then a staff member from the Board of Education could come down and uh, secure those individuals and bring them up if they needed to. And there's an elevator, right? For the yes, there's an elevator, yeah. So basically what I'm concerned about is, is somebody coming in and having the ability to, to wander. So they, they may want to go to the second floor, but they're off and, and wander somewhere on the first floor. I mean, you're pretty pretty comfortable that that wouldn't happen or you're trying to prevent that? Yeah, Richard, absolutely will not happen. Uh, uh, if you see some of the preliminary drawings that we've put together, uh, there's a basically a holding block for anybody that comes into that school uh, where they can't get any further than the uh, security office. Um, and the security office personnel has, uh, in a very secure um, uh, state, um, there's no way they can access the rest of the building as it's designed right now. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, I can only read financial statements and I can't read blueprints. So I had to ask the question. I'm sorry, <laughs> but thank you very much. No problem. Bye. Are there any other questions that board members have for Antonio? Thank you. Um, action item B. No, we got to take a uh, vote. We got to take a vote oh, first, right? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do a I'll do, do a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, Joe Britton? Yes. Uh, Rachel Chalesky? Aye. Kate Canetta? Yes. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinero? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolina? Yes. Passes. Motion so fast. Thank you. Uh, action item B. Rachel, would you do the uh, motion for action item B, please? Sure. Thank uh, you. I make a motion that the Board of Education accept for first reading policy 6114.8 emergencies and preparedness as accepted by the policy committee, exhibit 20 51. Motion been made by Rachel. Who second? Second. Joe? Yeah. Are there any questions uh, on motion? Any question concerning this policy? I've got a question, Gladys. All these uh, motions that we're voting for on the policies are just for the first reading. Is that correct? That's correct. This is the first okay. reading. The final reading would be done at our next board meeting, if I'm, if I'm uh, not yes. mistaken. Is, is it okay that if I have questions, can I write the questions to the committee rather than waste the time of the full board and let the committee evaluate them? I don't see why not. You know, just in the interest of saving time, they're, you know, just general questions. And if there's any issues, they could just respond or, or just to bring it up at the next meeting. Uh, right. Rather, you can, why rather than you take your time tonight to go through each of the ones. Uh, so, you know, so, Rich, so, Richard, that's what... That's the way it works. It might be even the general public would have that. If they have a question, they, they could send it to my office. Right. Um, and then I would share it with the policy committee uh, or, and right. maybe they can get answers in advance. So, yes, it's appropriate is what I'm saying. Okay. So I could direct it to, I'll direct it to the chair, to, to the superintendent and, and to the policy committee. Are we, may I yes. Uh, yes. Are we having a policy committee meeting before the next board meeting? No, we don't um, have one scheduled. So this would come up for a second reading at the next board meeting? Yes. 
And there, I believe that it, it needs to be, um, it needs to come up three times for the board before it can be accepted. Is was my understanding. So I'm um, so sorry. Be a second reading and a third reading, no? If, so if, if we came back the second time and there are a lot of questions, right. So we would just try to, the board would ask us to modify it and then we'd bring it back again. There's no rush. That's usually what happens, if there's any. Sometimes there isn't any and it's acceptable. It depends on it, but right. it can go another time. Yes. Okay. So, okay. so does it kick back? I'm sorry to interrupt, Gladys. I just want to clarify because I this is a procedural thing I need to understand and, and I'm wondering if anybody else is having the same question. When the policy uh, goes through the first reading and gets the approval by the board and then it goes back to the policy committee for another review or is it or does it go if you want me to try to answer i'll try to answer no because if you're doing it for the first reading and uh, say action item um the very first one action item a there was no right now i don't seem to be no questions or anything so to me that's acceptable so the next time we do it for the second reading it's completed unless you know i don't hear any um, one having any question for action item A now. So to me, that's done. So when we bring it back to the second reading, we vote on it and it's final. Unless I'm missing something. No, I, I think you're right, um, Mrs. Cooper. I'm just looking at the policies now, or the bylaws, and your bylaw 3.2 mm -hmm. is the one that ad addresses policy adoption. Mm -hmm. And it does look like um, there's a first reading um there can be any amendments or revisions placed on the board me meeting agenda um then there is policies will be adopted or amended after the second reading of the policy um and there can be discussion about changes then it doesn't say anything about them having to be consecutive meetings though so i think you probably could have your meeting your next meeting without including it and if you want to have time for the policy committee to meet um or you can discuss the amendments um at the next meeting when you're reviewing it for the second time it looks like what's the pleasure of the board as far as uh, making the amendments at the second meeting if there's any amendments to be made well, may I say, say something so that so so Richard has a couple of things he wants to question about it. So mm -hmm. we'll send in his letter or his email and then and then we the next time. Like, I mean, what's the purpose of first reading, second reading, third reading if we're not supposed to make changes or like you said, Gladys, uh, that, you know, it seems fine and we won't be going back to that one. Right. The, the the policy require the pol your board bylaw requires two readings. Two readings, right? Okay. It's pre it's pretty standard. I mean, you're getting it out to first of all, you had the, a subcommittee of board brainstorm, go through it, and put what they right. want together, and they hammered out these. It comes to the whole board. You read it tonight. If someone wanted to make some comments, and I certainly would be thoughtful, but it has to go out to the for a hearing to the general public. It goes out to them, and oh. generally, if there's some feedback for changes. We'd come back to the second meeting and we report on that. And sometimes, and I, I do remember once or twice where uh, we had, it had to go back for more conversation, mm -hmm. but pretty much the second time, the whole board as a whole would either accept, modify, make amendments to the policy. And then if they, then if they adopted it, then we would create guidelines administratively to, to, to uh, um, implement it. Mm -hmm. So it can go back. There is no rush is what I'm saying, as okay. Kim says. It's meant to air out. Okay. A, a question? So Ms. Ms. Cooper, I'm, I'm happy to schedule another meeting if that's necessary for the policy committee. Okay. In between yes. meetings. Okay. Uh, Mr. Silva had a question. Let me add. I, I think Kevin just solved, that, solved my question. If Rich has questions that should go to the committee, maybe just the solution is that if the committee is going to be meeting, not before our next meeting, but before the meeting after that, maybe we just don't put it on for our next meeting we put well, it on second for meeting, right right it's just an idea especially if there's no rush right yeah there's no rush no yeah yes yeah, so i was going to suggest that for the next policy anyway that it um be placed on hold and uh the media uh let's have time for the policy uh committee to meet and discuss 
the next policy that we're voting on. Okay. So we can do that, both of them together. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the motion, uh, uh, Mr. Yeah, Janela, so does that answer your questions? Yes, it does. But so if I vote yes tonight, that's. <laughs> You're voting to have it read publicly, that's all. That's all. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank so, you. Kate, you're uh, going to do the roll call? I'll do a roll call vote. Sure. Mm -hmm. Joe Britton? Aye. Rachel Chileski? Aye. Kate Canetta? Yes. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Joe DeSilva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Chinelli? Aye. Kathy Molinaro? Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Kathy. Sorry. I see that. I, I see that now. Thank you. <laughs> Al Russo. Aye. Amy Spolina. Yes. Motion so carried. Okay. okay. Um, Kate, you want to do um, action item C? Sure. Uh, I'll make a motion that the Board of Education accept for first reading policy 2131.1, appointment of designee for superintendent as accepted by the policy committee. Um, exhibit 20-52. Motion made by Kate. Second. Here, second. I'll second that. And Joe, second by Joe Britton. Any question in the discussion? Seeing none. Okay. We'll do a roll call vote again. Joe Britton. Yes. Aye. Rachel Chileski. Aye. Kate Canetta. Yes. Gladys Cooper. Yes. Lauren Daly. Yes. Joe De Silva. Yes, aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinero? Aye. Al Russo? Yes. Amy Spolino? Aye. Okay. Motion so carried. Rachel, would you do action item D, please? Sure. Um, I move that the Board of Education accept for first readings Board of Education Bylaw 9321, time, place, and notice of meetings as accepted by the policy committee, exhibit 20-53. Motion made by Rachel, seconded Second. by Joe De Silva. Are any questions concerning this motion? Seeing a uh, yes. Rachel, please. so um, this is the one that I'd like the policy committee to um, discuss further. I was wondering if um, uh, Kim had a chance to review it and did she have any advice to offer us regarding um, electronic meeting? Yeah, I did. Kevin, do you want to, Kevin and I, he sent it to me to review and I, I did give him some thoughts. Kevin, do you want to share those? You want me to do it? Go ahead, Kim. Okay. Um, so this is the one about going electronic in the, in the crisis. Um, my overarching thinking about it is I do share the opinion of Cabe, Cabe that I think that it should be with some reluctance that you go to um, a completely virtual meeting setting for people who cannot come to the meeting. Um, and the reason why I say that is I think um, partly just because um, typically in my experience boards are um, eager to have active participants. So people who come to the meetings who are elected board of ed officials and that um, if there is a way to do what we're doing now outside of the crisis, that the concern always historically had been that people would just call in for the meeting. Um, so that's the first thing. CABE, I think in an effort to recognize that, put in an alternate policy, which talked about if there was some reason why um, you could go to the board chair and, and ask for a specific exception. That you know is the kind of thing you would use if somebody was in ill health and they couldn't come to the meeting. So um, I, I guess my feedback for you is the first one gives me some discomfort Comfort. The alternative isn't awful um, and that it may be useful to you. But, you know, if you did find yourself in that situation, you also could leave the attendance policy the way it is and vote in an exception for an emergency circumstance. You could do that. Um, so it's really kind of a conversation for you folks about, you know, how do you feel about it? or not um, um, you want people physically coming to the meetings or whether you want this alternative. Um, this, what we're doing right now is a slightly different situation because there's a governor's order that changes, basically changes FOIA, changes the rules of engagement here. So it's really not so troubling to me to use this as an emergency policy because of the COVID crisis. Um, but you know, it's a good, it, it's a topic that you all revisit from time to time. And it really is for you all to figure out what your comfort level is on, on, the policy itself. 
the, the content on them is fine. It's really just a, a choice for you all to make. Any other questions? Actually, Gladys, I had a question about, I think probably for Kim. Um, in terms of the second half of that policy, the, you know, permissive, whatever, um, I saw a line in there about not using uh, electronic, not doing executive session and electronic. Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of a concern about that language because we've already done that. And I'm just a little, I, obviously it's different because this is an emergency and this right. is all of us and it's under COVID. Right. I'm just worried about having a policy that states we're not supposed to do something we've already done. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair point, Joe. Um, I guess I'm a little less concerned about it because we're operating under the executive okay. order suspending the FOIA requirements. Okay. So, but Excellent. a fair Thank point you. completely. Yep. Any more questions? Rachel? You okay? we, no, I've got a question. Yeah. Mr. Danella? Yeah. Are we saying that we're only allowed to do the electronics because of the current situation of the pandemic? And once it's resolved, then we are no longer eligible to, to do electronic meetings. Um, now, could we change yeah. that based on a board policy? Right. So I think that probably all that the CABE policy currently addresses is the attendance of elected board members at the meeting. It presumes that the meeting's going on in situ, in a location, and that people may need to call in. Um, the current CABE policy doesn't contemplate a virtual meeting. And I think my answer to it, honestly, Dick, would be I'm not sure that you can create a policy that is less restrictive than the FOIA rule. You know, the FOIA rule is you hold a meeting and, and you do your business at the meeting. So I'm not sure you really could change it by board policy, but I would anticipate that in light of the fact that it will have been many months that all of we boards are functioning this way, that you may see some changes to what you can and cannot do. Because what a lot of boards are saying is, look, you know, you had at one point, you had something like 55 people on this meeting. So you're getting more people attending. So I think there's going to be a hybrid solution. But the answer to your original question is, I'm not really comfortable that you could legislate yourself to something that's different from what FOIA is already telling you. You know, because right. it does have merit from a practical point of view. You know, you mentioned earlier for <clears throat> under, let's say, extenuating cir circumstances, uh, one being in the case when I personally was in a hospital and had to miss a meeting. So that would be a situation. We've had instances when we had board members who, because of their jobs, um, traveled a lot and couldn't attend many meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and if they were, we allowed the virtual meetings that would allow them to have the attendance and they wouldn't have the stigma of not attending the meetings mm -hmm. or not fulfilling the role as a board thing. The other thing is, is going forward in terms of what we've learned and using right now, you know, we can have meetings during snowstorms. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really not, I'm sort of confused in terms of, you know, what we're going to be allowed to do and, and not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think I think of it this way, Dick, is for right now, what this policy is contemplating is a change to your way of doing business when the meeting is ongoing in the boardroom. So FOIA requires you to hold a meeting, to state the place, to do all of those things. Um, and these alternate policies are talking about if, as you said, if you, Richard Ginelli, can't make a meeting, you can't just decide to call in without the board having a policy to accommodate that. So that's mm -hmm. why you're entertaining the idea. Um, my only point is, I don't think that Connecticut sunshine laws have caught up now to this technology, but I do think that with all of us using it so intensely that we could expect to see some tweaking that this kind of a, a meeting could be allowable if that's what you wanted to do. It just seems strange not to take advantage of the current situation sure. and the progress we're doing is to just use it more effectively and efficiently mm -hmm. you know, going ahead. So, so Ms. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ginelli, for, and I, for clarification, the current first reading of this policy gives author, the board authorizes the board chair to allow um, other members to participate electronically. So this this provides for that opportunity. Um, but I think I'm also hearing that the, the policy committee would like to discuss further. And I can certainly understand that given the conversations around this policy 
uh, with the last board. Um, but but this right now, currently in its first reading, with the board is authorizing the board chair to allow individual board members to participate electronically. Um, so so with given the scenarios you just shared, um, if the board approves it, there would be a space where that could be allowed. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any other questions concerning this? Seeing none, roll call case. All right. Uh, Joe Britton? Aye. Rachel Cholesky? Yes. Kate Canetta? Yes. Gladys Cooper? Yes. Lauren Daly? Yes. Joe DeSilva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Richard Ginelli? Aye. Uh, Kathy Molinaro? Aye. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, I'll move I to my next uh, one. Dr. Sass, could I just ask Kelly a question? Uh, yes. And, uh, she said it's 330 students for a summer school. What ages, Kelly, are the students? So they range from preschool, so age three, all the way up until age 21. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, if not, I'll go to chronic distribution, chronic, Chromebook distribution. <laughs> Is Gina? Yes, I'm here, Dr. Sell. Thank Go you. Ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the Chromebook distribution is continuing. We moved to a model of um, putting it at the food sites uh, so that it's being done Monday, um, Wednesday, Friday at each food site. Um, parents can sign up uh, as they have um, since the beginning of distance learning. Um, by Friday, we shall have distributed close to 6,000 devices since the beginning of this pandemic, and uh, we, we're doing about 70 devices a day. We'll keep doing that until um, everyone has a device or everyone, uh, or we stop receiving requests. In addition, we're gearing up to receive our um, Windows 10 machines from um, the state for our 912 students. So um, we're, the tech team is a training, uh, attending state training this week to um, set those up and um, get ready to roll those out for the fall. Gina, you know, because the board may be wondering, as we're, this is a new process for us, which is a gift to, to have this, just a little bit of our thinking about the Chromebooks and the return policy that we're thinking, Let, just so that they have an idea of what you're thinking. So um, our, Initial thought is that um, we'll let most of the kids keep their Chromebooks over the summer, uh, especially if they need to use them for summer school. Um, the children that are moving away or graduating, uh, we're gonna come up with, um, they'll, we'll have a drop off uh, date where they can just drive up and we'll, um, we'll do the, the distribution in reverse, basically. They'll drive up and we'll take the device from them instead of handing it to them in the car. Um, and we're in the process of coming up with um, the dates for for that now. Okay. Um, okay. I've got uh, next on the list here. Before uh, I, Aaron did talk about it, and I think you've all gotten that this uh, that that publication. I think our TV stations yes. also talked about it. But it just just comment that our teachers and staff and administrators, um, their passion for the work that they do. It's not just their job, but it's their, their life's work. And you could see it come out uh, just in that example of reaching out to these families and just making sure that their kids are taken care of. So I just say thank you and God bless to all of them. Um, the next thing we're gonna do some prayers Lauren, on, on the Lauren budget. The Lauren has a question, I said Lauren. Oh, Lauren, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, that was an accident. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you for your group for uh, the distribution. Yes. There. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate that. That's been helpful. Thank you. And, and Dr. Sabbath, you're moving very fast. Could I also ask a question to Gina? Go, uh, go ahead. My question is, uh, what happened? Everyone is not going to be fruitful in returning their Chromebooks. So, I guess my question is, is it a dumb question? How do you get that Chromebook if they're not going to deliver it back? So we have, um, we obviously can see where they are 
you know, when they log on, we, we um, can pull where they are and, and um, we can remotely control their device. Okay. Um, so we, so if we fail to get it back, we will basically shut down the device and lock it down. So it won't be of any use to them. They won't be able to take it anywhere to be unlocked or anything like that. It, it will essentially become a paperweight for them. Okay, thank you, I didn't know that, okay. Yep. Okay. I asked the same questions, so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering the same thing down the road. Okay, so let's, uh, I did mention lock it clear work. Okay, Courtney, you're there. So why don't we, um, you know, we've been asking the mayor about, you know, where the budget's at, and you all know what the process is, I have to tell you. Um, it's, it's, it's a whole different way of going about the approval this year. Uh, we do have uh, a number. I, I, I did ask if I could share it tonight, and we have permission to do that. Um, and I, I will say to you that as Courtney puts you through this, um, the word you're going to hear me use a lot is braided. Um, we have uh, money from CARE. We have money from Alliance titled. Uh, we're going to try to braid things together. Um, and we have a lot of braiding to do. So, um, Courtney, why don't you kind of let the board know uh, status about what's going on? And then uh, we'll see if there's any questions. Sure. So thanks, Dr. Sal. So um, you know that we're in challenging economic times. Um, and so the city has agreed to, is going to announce adding 1.25 million to the budget. Um, that's the base budget that we had when we started the year last year. So um, it doesn't include the 1.273 one time that they added. So. Um, that's what they're agreeing for a city ad um, and that um, our ask if you recall if we include the Alliance funding was about 14 million um, and, and so between the Alliance money and the city money um, it's, it's not getting us the you know full ask so we're gonna have to look at some modification um, the city funds is 1.25 million we're expecting to get about 2.24 million from CARES funding. That's the federal emergency money. It's one-time money that will be spent by September of next year. And it's for um, technology enhancements that we've done and will continue to do to meet the needs of students next year as we roll out um, the model that will be rolled out safely for students to return to school next year. Um, accessing curriculum, um, addressing safety at reopening, social emotional supports. That care funding is um, one-time money, as Dr. Sal said, we're gonna have to work to, to braid the funding together to meet needs, but it's a one-time basis. Uh, we also have 2.7 million, as you know, in new Alliance funds that we had talked with you about programming when we were working through the budget initially. And we, we're gonna also have an additional carryover fund. So the state on a one-time basis is allowing us to carry over unspent grant money from this year as a result of COVID closure. Um, so we do have additional grant funds that are gonna roll over. That'll be part of that braided strategy that Dr. Stell spoke about. So it'll be a challenge. We wanna work with you through the challenge. Um, our carry forward number, I know Rich asks about that. As, as you recall, our carry forward number was about 4.6 million. And then we also need the 1.2. So just to roll our budget forward, it's about $6 million. So that's the ongoing need because it includes staffing and contractual increases. So that's something that we'll have to address, you know, as we as we develop next year's budget. Um, so all our carry forward is about 4.4%, but the actual city ad is about 9.3%. So it's a di it's short, but like Dr. Sal mentioned, we have again carryover funds from the title grants from Alliance as well as the new CARES funding that we're going to get. Year that we expect is about 2.2 million. It's a little confusing, but um, the point is we've got to tighten our belts a bit next year, um, but we do have some additional supplemental funding that will get us ready to return safely to school, address some of the distance learning and curriculum needs that we continue to have. Courtney, I think, um, you know, it, it, for an understanding for the board, we also have uh, talked to the mayor and um, that money will pass through categorically to us. That is not something that's going to be taken. 
would you speak to, we have fund balances yeah. and um, we've spoken with him to create uh, an account for carryover that will apply to the next year's operation budget. Now, those, all of you, the board members know this and um, the, these one-time infusions are somewhat difficult because next year you have to make up for that and the other. But uh, our budget has been year to year here. So, um, you know, it's my intent to present you all a budget that's going to at least bring us forward and also start working on the achievement gap. But it's going to require rating any money that we save this year uh, and, and, and allowing us to put it into there's three buckets. I understand it's going to be the insurance bucket that we always had as a fund balance, one on technology and one in special ed that we could distribute and carry money. Three areas that are could be um, pretty um, explosive in our budget, particularly the medical I worry deeply about. Um, we're saving half as much per month. And when we open up again, people will be going to the, their doctors, understandably. So that may just balloon on us. And special ed is, is, is a, um, always a question for us. And technology, we need help. So we've discussed uh, opening those accounts up and placing money into it, I, I will caution the board, for you to use that money, you being us, with your permission, we do have to ask the city council. It's not just ours, but the mayor supports us with a fund balance, knowing that we had asked for as much as we did, and that we're, and this is gonna really kind of tie our hands that uh, we're gonna need these fund balances and savings. And and we're working on what that is, I, I, I you know, and. And it's a, we didn't really want to put an exact number because it does change. Um, but as we get another week or two, we'll have a, a better idea, right, Courtney? Yeah, and that that fund balance, you know, the the biggest outlier, as you all know, having talked to Joe and spent time with this, the insurance fund. And while we were in COVID, you know, during this close down, like Dr. Sell mentioned, we've seen some really significant savings because people haven't been able to go to the doctor. And like Dr. Sell said, there'll be a backlog. And we may see people, you know, with significant illnesses, we hope we don't, but we've got to set aside. So the city's agreed to work with us to use our fund balance this year, which is mostly related to that, those insurance um, savings, which we have another month and a half left to see come in. And if it's coming in as we see it, we'll have a decent amount in the fund balance. That can be set up in the reserve. We're allowed to put up to 25%, as you know. So we're currently at about 17%, so we can fund the difference so that next year we'll have a little bit of extra so that we can balance out those peaks and, and, and valleys in the insurance experience because we're self-insured. And then in addition, as Dr. Sal mentioned, the technology, we can set up a reserve with the city that we'd have to get their permission to use, um, as well as um, special ed, you know, as we, if we see an increase in outplacements, that would help us. So that's something new that would be great that we can do. No, um, so, and then the, the final uh, piece that we, we didn't mention earlier is the 550,000 from the um, matrix funding, Dr. Sal. So the city has agreed that we can talk about that, that it looks likely that we will get that next year and that matrix funding can be used to offset our Granville lease that we have signed, as Kelly mentioned in an earlier board meeting for our pre-K, um, um, you know, where we're gonna put a majority of our pre-K classrooms, not all of them. Um, so. Yeah, and the fund balance, one additional last thing I would mention about our fund balance is that the city has also agreed if we pursue a strategy to give us a one-time appropriation. So not just to put it in reserve, which would be available just on an ongoing, like one time, but in a reserve, but to our appropriation, but it requires the approval of the Board of Finance. So for us to use our, 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 our fund balance from this year, if we were to get a one-time appropriation for next year. So that's on the, on the, um, um, as a possibility for one strategy as well. Um, just, uh, I know this questions uh, for, we started um, looking at anticipating this and I will go without saying, um, uh, if we have a, a uh, reenactment of last August, we're in trouble, one, we're in trouble. And um, this core, this money for the COVID uh, virus, um, we um, are, um, I guess, participating in uh, some grants. We're hoping to help us. But, um, you know, if we have to add buses, if we have to add uh, teachers and cleaning 
uh, individuals. I, I said to the mayor, I don't know what we're going to do. So, that, you know, we can't just shoulder all of that on the amount here. So there was a recognition for that. Um, if you're saying, what is it you're going to do? Uh, we're just going to um, not fill any positions that we do not need filled. I will tell the board that typically we have 25 retirees and we do take uh, credit for that in the budget. We currently have eight. So that impacts us as well. Um, and uh, the lens that we're going to look at is um, closing the gap using our uh, funds from the state and the alliance to assist with those uh, techniques and then um, place the programs in special ed and support that we need and try to be reasonable in our um, class sizes. Uh, and then, you know, just keep working on it and put something in front of you to see how, what you think. So Kim, I don't know if you have anything to add or, or, or Kelly or Kevin before I end this part of it. No, Anybody? I don't have anything. Nope, I do not. Okay, okay. Um, does anyone have any questions concerning the budget? Yeah, I've got a question, Dr. Sauer or Courtney. It's, it's very confusing in all your terminology. I look at it last year, we had two budgets. We had an operational budget where you asked for $11 million. And then you had another, for the first time we put it together, an alliance budget. And we increased that by $2.7 million. So somewhere along the line, you're looking for... 13 or 14 million dollars collectively. Yeah. If you separate the thing on the operational budget that we put together for the 11 million dollars, you're telling me that we got 1.2 million dollars as an appropriation against the operational budget, number one. Yes. You use the word of carryovers. I don't know what the carryover refers to. Does this mean that whatever unspent dollars in the operational budget that we normally would spend? by the end of the year or the excess money we had, we would put toward this insurance reserve. And I think that insurance reserve of $6 million should be pretty close. It, is that going to be given to us as, as a reserve? And then you, you also have a grant budget where the Alliance money is at. So you commingling to me, it's very confusing when you're commingling all this stuff, I like to see it in terms of the way we presented the budget so that we know what we're doing. In a nutshell, if we're getting collectively six or seven million dollars with all of the stuff that you're talking about versus an ask of a 14 million dollars, uh, the picture doesn't seem to be apparently that rosy. Well, it's not rosy, Rich. I mean, uh, we just got that number uh, last Friday and Monday to share it. I mean, what we're going to do is do exactly what you're saying. We have to look at all of those um, those those accounts and by sector, how much of the alliance. But you have to all remember what you take out of alliance can't be serendipitously used anywhere. It's got to be close to the team. I'm not saying there are two separate and distinct budgets. I'm not talking about alliance. I'm just talking about the funding for the $11 million budget that we have so far. Of the eleven million dollars, you're telling me we got one point two million dollars from the city, That's and correct. maybe another two point two from CARES that we can utilize against that. So we've got a huge for shortfall. You're looking at four point nine million dollars, which we said were maintenance just to turn on the lights. No, I, no, I realize that, and that's why I said, you know, this is no easy task. We're looking at fund balances. <laughs> well. No, we're looking at fund balances to help cobble money towards that and mitigate that amount. And that's where we're going to need the mayor to permit us to do that. If, when you say if, fund if, balances, I'm, I don't mean well, to let's just make Let's make an assumption. Let's say when we end July 1st, we have, based on the savings, not using substitutes, based on money from uh, medical, and we have $2.5 million. I'm going to ask for that to be used for us. But I, okay. you're not permitted, or we're not permitted to have a savings account other than in those areas. So only legitimate way to do it is to pass it through to those accounts and then say, okay, we're going to need money for special ed. We're going to need money for, um, um, uh, 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 what do you call, for benefits. Yeah, and, right. And, and use that money to help cobble up what you said before and shore up where we, the, 
the 11 million we didn't get because we didn't get it. We got actually the point point nine three percent, not adding the 200. And, I'm sorry, not adding the uh, 550 thousand from your uh, from the developer. And we got a lot of work ahead of us. Yes, and it'll be divided that way. Just yeah. to be just to be clear, though, Rich, really briefly, but just simply, the fund balance is the city side, the operating budget. So the fund balance is the one that Dr. Sal talked about, our, our balance from this year. And the carryover is related to grants. It's a one-time thing that the state's allowing with our titles and our alliance funding for this year for underspending. It's a carryover amount. So we have that, that carryover from the grants and the fund balance from, from the city side. So yeah. at, the last, at the last board meeting, then to use your terminology, fund balance, we were talking about somewhere about, if I remember it says around about 450,000. Mm -hmm. So how did it go from 450 to two and a half million? Is that the, the, the benefit that you're, you're estimating that wasn't used relative to the health insurance account? Yeah, we're seeing every month, we're seeing a little more than a million dollars better than what our budget was in health insurance during the COVID closure. It's huge. We didn't predict it. And so, yes, to answer your question, that's, that's most of it. But that can come back to bite you next year when at some point people then want to go and get do their normal checkups and things like that. So right, like right, that's right. Right. So you just may get a double win. Has to put it, put it in a reserve, and then also you know we're going to budget appropriately for it next year as well. Okay. The well, we're trying. We're trying to, um, as the board's always asked me to, not not to reduce uh, teachers to keep teachers in front of kids. And now we're to the point where we have to support a lot of the uh, bilingual students and no students that are in need of uh, special needs. So it's 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 quite a stretch, Rich, no doubt. Um, and we'll work more with the uh, mayor in terms of uh, these fund balances, whatever they turn out to be. Um, you know, you do have the COVID money, you have um, um, some leasing money and other things that we need. What you don't have is. This money we were asking for was taking us to another level. Right now, you know, we're just trying to keep us moving forward and, and not lose ground. I mean, that's what we're basically doing. Yeah, I mean, just picture in my mind when the budget was presented. We, as I said, in addition to the four point nine for maintenance, you had about eight hundred thousand for the for Augusto's uh, group, and you had a couple of million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, for the climate, the, the terminology of climate. But when is it your position to generate some some information so that we could you know at least meet and discuss you know discuss what you're looking to to do i'm not looking to rush you um but it's just for myself in, in terms of a timetable is to now that you got this information um what well, it we, to i would hope i would hope sometime next week you want to have a finance group that's fine like after next wednesday or thursday i'll ask courtney mm -hmm. we started uh, doing some numbers and you know we're just working through it next week would be you know we're about four weeks behind because we haven't had a number yeah and no, that's, no, I understand. yeah I'm not but we'll try next week to have a finance committee meeting so at the next board meeting we'd have some real you know some real tangible things to look at because we're not certain other than yeah we're not gonna as you said climate well we can't do that and but the augusto stuff parts of it we have to do um and special ed parts of it we have to do there's so much we'd like to do that are not going to get done things like that but we need to i think next week courtney unless you have a different time frame i'm looking more towards maybe thursday or but uh, that's up to you yeah, no, that sounds great. We made some, uh, we can certainly have things prepared by then, definitely. Okay. Um, Whatever, you know, at your convenience, I know you got a thousand things to do, so no, this I'm not is looking the most to important you. now. <laughs> Just uh, give us a timetable and then we'll see if we could go through and understand this and, and evaluate what has to be done. Understood, Rich, yeah. Um, all right, thank you very much. I, I have a couple of questions, if yeah. I may. Um, Courtney, make sure I understand the conversation you and Rich just had. And I, some of this may be I'm not as deep into the detail as Rich. We asked previously for effectively about a $9.95 .9 million increase, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And we're getting 1.2. Correct. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you say percentage or millions? Dollars. Millions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're right. Yes. 
I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not, I went to law school because math wasn't my major in college, but even I can tell that's only slightly more than 10% of what we asked for. Correct me if I'm wrong. This, what we're getting doesn't even hold us harmless for carrying on what we were doing this year, correct? Correct. If we didn't have the, what, if we didn't have the fund balance and the, and the carryovers and the grants, which are, we're going to use to braid to do things that we need to do for next year, that's correct. And yeah. the COVID money. And the so COVID functionally money. speaking, what this is, is this is a budget cut by the city of Danbury. I mean, it, we've been talking with the city and, and, you know, in awareness that they're going to work with us to have funds, you know, from our fund balance and, you know, in awareness of the carryover from the grant funds, um, they're hopeful to work with us to make sure that we have what we need for next year. It but I'm just trying to, but yes, you're right. Yes. Yes. I'm just trying to make sure I have it right. The fund balance savings is money we stumbled on because of what happened this year in terms of what we saved. And the CARES Act money is money that was legislated by Congress. Correct. So in terms of what the city of Danbury doing is they are effectively giving us less money than it would take to operate our schools at a bare minimum and carry out this year's activities by a significant number. Right. Yes, if you're considering just the city operational funds and the city budget, that would be right. Yeah, that's correct. One also, other question. You yeah, mentioned me, Joe, just think of the pardon me, Joe. Just think last year comes September. This year, September, we asked for Dr. Sal asked for a special appropriation of $1.2 million because of the increase that we yeah. had in enrollment. The $1.2 million allocation we just received basically covers only oh, that. So you look at it, there's no increase. I, I I have a question. You mentioned Courtney, the matrix money. Mm-hmm. And that we should be able to use that next year. Mm -hmm. Query. That was part of our budget for this year. Yeah. How are we making up the fact that that wasn't, that was, correct me if I'm wrong, that was part of the money we were supposed to, that was contemplated in what we were spending for academic year 1920, not 2021, correct? Correct. Yes. So that didn't come in this year. It did come in. So it came into us as an appropriation. The city may or may not have received that revenue, but we were able to spend the funds that were associated with that. This we got year. the money for the, okay. Excellent. Thank and Joe, you. we should get it again next year. Yeah. Okay. We, we, I, because we, once we get question. it, I'm good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a good question. Are there any other questions for Courtney or Dr. Sam? Okay. So uh, Gladys, I guess what we're going to try to do is get a finance committee meeting next week, work on some of these things, and then um, I hope at the next board meeting um, we, we'll have something much more substantive for everybody okay. to look at. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have. Um, let me just turn my page here. Um, plan update. Yeah, we have. The re-entry plan, uh, you heard Aaron in the beginning, we do have a plan, um, uh, we have a plan, I'm sorry, we have a committee, a re-entry committee. Now, it's it's a core committee, and that committee will expand out to reaching out to other folks. Uh, it's just, you, you can't have a committee of 900 people, but we have a core committee. And Kevin, maybe you want to talk to the board uh, a little bit about what you're thinking and what we're doing uh, with it? Sure. Sure, and I, I will I will start with the points um, that we heard earlier from Erin because um, she I mean she was absolutely right. There is going certainly going to be a need to drill drill down further in the organization to make sure we have the feedback um, from the representative departments. Um, and so, as 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 everyone on this board might imagine, um, I'm hearing from a lot of folks saying, "Hey, you know, when when can I have an opportunity to um, represent my department?" or you know, we have some ideas as classroom teachers, et cetera, and I understand and appreciate all of them. Um, this this initial phase um, that we're, this initial phase, this is our second meeting. We have a meeting tomorrow afternoon, security and safety committee. Um, and so we have the chief of police, the fire chief, the um, person in part charge of the Department of Health. We have our district physician, um, and then of course our, um, our district nurse and, and Kathy O'Dowd. 
and, and, and then a number of um, district representatives, including, as Aaron had mentioned earlier, um, someone from the, you know, those two major bargaining units, the admin union representative and the teacher representative unit. And so this, this initial group, this first level group, if you will, is really to get the feedback from the experts in the field to, to, to give us some guidance on what we can and cannot do right now, right? And so firsthand guidance from our district physician and, 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 and Department of Health around, um, you know, clarification around the guidance for uh, bringing kids into school, what is best practice um, if we're going to be bringing kids and family, kids to schools and teachers to schools on a modified basis. And so we need, we need to make sure we understand, um, you know, given, given this uncharted territory, making sure it's clear what the questions are and the you know, things that we need to answer as a district. Um, we are envisioning this moving forward to drill down further into the organization. Right now, you know, we don't have elementary representation up in, you know, to, to, to inform what an elementary schedule could look like. Uh, we don't have high school representation to represent what a high school schedule could look like. Um, and so we recognize that those folks are going to need to be at the table. Um, in addition, you know, we need folks from our PE department, our music department. Um, you know, there's, if, if we're going to be in school on a modified basis, uh, certainly we're going to need protocols to address instruments that none of us necessarily have the expertise to talk, to speak to. So we'll make sure that those folks are at the table. Um, and, and that's just an example. Um, just going back to our last meeting, which was April 30th, um, I think this is the first time I was in the meeting and we wrote notes for a meeting that had question marks all over it. Like all of the notes were essentially question marks. Um, and I think that speaks to the uncharted waters that we're going into. But, um, you know, there were questions, all of the questions that I think our community is asking, um, they were asked at this, they were asked in this meeting on April 30th. Um, and what, what we have done um, for in preparation for tomorrow's meeting is put together a draft plan in response to all of that feedback. Um, there, there, there is guidance coming back nationally. The, the White House has a blueprint for reopening schools. Uh, we've seen some, some other plans that, that have been released from other states. And then a handful of districts around the country have also released plans. And so all of those plans ha are, have certainly informed ours. Um, our plan is going, there are a number of links. Um, Style and I had talked a couple of days ago um, and love the fact that there's some research in there that's going to help inform some of our academic decisions. Um, and then the rest of the plan really talks about safety. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we're going to take every precaution necessary to make sure our staff and our kids are safe. Um, we have a, there, there are a number of options out there from um, a staggered schedule to AB schedule. Um, you know, to some type of hybrid, and we will certainly be exploring all of those things. But no matter what we do, we will not have kids and staff back in the school uh, without all of the appropriate um, safety precautions and protocols in place, which is why we have the experts in the room helping us land on, um, land on, you know, land on the, the appropriate mitigation strategies. Um, so we envision tomorrow, uh, we're going to have um, breakout, we'll have like 20 people, 20 plus people on a call tomorrow. Um, we will have breakout sessions, breakout groups virtually for those, for the 20 people on the group and get feedback on our plan. I'm anticipating that this draft plan that folks will be looking at, um, that there'll be considerable adjustments to, to the plan, which I'm, I'm hoping for and anticipating. Um, and as we get further guidance from the state and further guidance over these next few months, um, I feel comfortable and confident we'll have something that the community feels feels safe. Feel, feel, they, would, they would feel good about sending their kids back to school. Um, just so the board, because it was brought up, we started about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, ordering supplies for next year. So just just want you to know we've done that, but no way that we ordered, I think, enough of what we think we're going to need if we have to provide, um, you know, everybody's. PPEs, whatever. But I don't know if they have any questions of Kevin. Do you know which board members are rep? I, I, I'm i sorry. Mr. Russo. Mr. Russo, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I have nothing else, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we move down to uh, information. Do you have any additional information, Dr. Sam? No. no. Okay, okay. So the board chairperson report. Uh, my report is, is uh, very briefly, uh, the evaluation committee met 
on um, Monday and um, to discuss the uh, annual evaluation process. And given the challenges presented by the current pandemic, uh, the closure and the tremendous time and attention um, involved in the move to distant learning, we determined that this year it would be most appropriate for us as a committee to use the CAP, the CAVES CAPS um, recommendation and superintendent evaluation form. As was suggested that last year, it was suggested last year. And to, um, to narrow the focus to four areas that are set forth in the superintendent goals. Those four areas are number one, family, school, and community partnership, planning for growth, number three, accountability and organizational learning, and number four, college and career readiness for all students. Um, we, the committee sort of decided that we are going to um, recommend a narrative for Did we just lose her? Looks like she froze right. up there. Yeah, I and think so. There, oh, there we go. Gladys, Gladys, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Your uh, your signal cut out uh, about um, partway through that last sentence. If you could just repeat it, please. Actually, Gladys, uh, your signal cut out right after you said college and career readiness, the last bullet, if you can. OK, uh, the last uh, bullet was college and career readiness for all students. OK. So I, we have the other all four, right? Okay. And then there was one more sentence after that, Gladys. College so and we want to, the, the board will be recommending a narrative this year. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to use part of the form and we're going to be making it into a narrative in those four areas that I just mentioned. And for all board members, um, we all have the superintendent evaluation form. And if you don't have a copy, let me know and I'll make sure Carol gets it to you tomorrow. So you can have a time to look at it and digest it, okay? Um, secondly, um, I just wanna uh, thank the committee members, you know, uh, for coming out uh, and those chairs, Joe Britton had a committee meeting, Rachel had a committee meeting and thank everyone for putting um, forth and having um, board members of the committee express their concern. Uh, the next, the last thing I sort of want to say, I want to appreciate everyone uh, because I believe we should work together. And uh, I know some people don't like to be called on at last minute. And I thank Rachel and I had talked to uh, Kate earlier and I asking you to please read your information. And if I call you, ask you to make a motion, it's just have everybody participate. So uh, that's my only thing, okay? And it's not gonna be the same people all the time. This is a new year, we wanna do something different and I want people to participate, okay? Thank you. If I don't have anything else, um, I'm entertain a motion to adjourn. So Second. <laughs> motion, who made the motion? I said so moved. Okay. Oh. Okay. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all so very much. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.